On the surface, your life is as smooth as assorted paint, as colorful as the hues it conveys, as vibrant as its most brilliant yellow, and as rich as its resounding blues. The perfect blend. But on the inside, well, Welcome to Soul Care. Well, if you ask most people how they're really doing, they'll probably respond with either the word exhausted or overwhelmed. These words are actually the enemies of our faith, the enemies of our soul. John Ortberg once said, for most Christians, the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith, it's that we'll become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it. We'll just skim our lives instead of actually living. And so what's the answer to our chronic exhaustion? Well, one of the buzzwords these days is self-care. Eat a keto diet, do some intermittent fasting, or get your daily steps up, monitor your sleep, go to bed earlier, or try to get more me time, plan for spa days and manis and petties, or maybe some extra shopping trips to get your mind off of things. That stuff is considered self-care, but I wanna propose to you that if you're gonna make any kind of lasting impact on your exhausted and overwhelmed life, if you're gonna live a life of peace and confidence and purpose, you're gonna need something more than self-care. It's what we're talking about this whole month. It's called soul care. And while you can get self-care by going to the gym or going to the spa or going to bed earlier, you, you can only get soul care by going to Jesus. And there's some of you here today who are in soul fatigue. Your soul has been neglected. And I think there's some common warning signs that your soul is being neglected. Thanks to Carrie Newhoff for this list, but here's some warning signs. The first is that your passion fades. Like everybody struggles with a lack of passion from time to time, but this is a place of sustained motivational loss. How about this? You no longer feel the highs and lows. Like if you're healthy, you feel things, you experience highs and lows, but when the main emotion is numbness, you need to pay attention. Little things make you disproportionately emotional. So treating small things like big things and big things like small things are both signs that something deeper is wrong. How about everyone drains you? So people are a mixed bag for sure, but when nobody energizes you and everyone is a drain, then you've reached the point where they're, they're not the problem, you are. Another sign is that you're becoming cynical. Like if you find cynicism advancing at a rapid rate, it may be a sign that your soul is depleted. Cynicism never finds a home in a healthy soul. Sometimes nothing satisfies you. That's a sign of depression. It's also a sign that your soul is neglected. Another indicator is that you can't think straight. You lose the ability to think clearly. And your, your productivity is dropping. You're working long hours but producing little. You find yourself both busy and bored. That's a warning sign. Another one is that you're self-medicating. You're trying to numb the pain by overeating or overworking or sexual addictions or drinking or impulsive spending or drugs. You've chosen self-medication instead of self-care to deal with the pain. Another indicator is that you don't laugh anymore. Now this seems like such a small thing but it's actually a very, very big thing. And finally, maybe no sleep, uh, sleep no longer refuels you. Like not replenishing your energy when you take time off is a major warning sign that your soul might be fried. And if as I went through that list, a bunch of those warning signs were true of you, you need soul care. Now, if we're gonna talk about soul care, we better establish what the soul is. So the Bible doesn't give one verse that provides a dictionary definition, but there are many references throughout the Bible that help us to understand what it is. So let me summarize here, what is a soul? First of all, the soul is the non-physical part of you that makes you, you. So the human soul is central to your personhood. You don't have personhood with just a body, you need a soul too. It's also the part of you that is eternal. It's the part of every human being that lasts eternally after the body experiences death. Finally, it's the part of you that needs to be cared for so you can thrive. Usually people take great care of the outside and neglect the inside. Like you make sure that you're put together on the outside, your clothes are just right, your vibe is right, that you have the right you know, ride, the right house. You, you make sure that the outside is taken care of. It's like that old iceberg picture. There's that part on top that everyone sees, but there's this whole huge part underneath the water that represents what's really going on with you. 
But Jesus talked about the danger of caring for the outside stuff and neglecting the inside. He, he said it this way in Mark 8, 36. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his very soul? And the answer to Jesus' rhetorical question here is, is nothing. It doesn't profit someone at all to be thriving on the outside and deteriorating on the inside. We, we tend to settle, you see, for chasing success instead of tending our soul. But the fact remains that if you lose your soul, you've lost everything. And so let's use this working definition today for the soul. The soul is the immaterial, eternal life center of human beings. And if your soul is the most important part of you, it must be properly cared for. It needs to be tended like a garden. It needs a keeper. And that keeper is you under God's direction. You are responsible for the condition of your soul. And so like a garden, your soul needs to be nourished and it needs to be fed and watered. You need to create the right conditions like a greenhouse for it to flourish. You need to pay attention to it. When there are weeds, you need to pull them. When there's disease spreading, you have to fight it off. And for some of you today, your soul is wilting. Maybe worse, maybe it's dying. Like when I read that list earlier, you were like, yeah, that's, that's me. Well, I wanna give you some hope today that it doesn't have to be like that. In fact, the Christian life promises just the opposite. And I wanna reference both an Old Testament and a New Testament text today. You'll probably be familiar with both. The first is in the top five of the most famous passages in the whole Bible. It's in Psalm 23. And unfortunately, we associate it with funerals and death when actually it holds a lot of the keys to life. So I just want to look at the very beginning, the very first three verses of this incredible promise. David, who knew a lot about shepherding, wrote these words. He said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. You know, when you picture this scene in your mind and you hear green pastures, you may be picturing the beautiful Pennsylvania field filled with long, lush green grass for the sheep to be grazing on in a beautiful countryside. But what, what you need to remember is that David is writing this from the context of the Judean wilderness. Like when a shepherd found grass for his sheep, it was sparse and most welcome because finally the sheep could lie down. Finally, the sheep could rest. Their bellies would be full for at least a night. And the still waters here, I mean, the little literal Hebrew phrase is waters of rest. The offer of life with the good shepherd, you see, is the promise of soul restoration. An invitation to get off the hamster wheel of life and into true soul revival. And this doesn't come naturally. It takes intentionality. It takes a certain rhythm. Dallas Willard said it this way. He said, you must arrange your days so that you're experiencing deep contentment and joy and confidence in your everyday life with God. Properly tending to your soul involves arranging your life in sacred rhythms, building in certain regular practices that will allow you to be conscious of your relationship with God at all times. Probably the simplest definition I've heard of soul care is learning to live your life with God. In fact, let's sneak in our big idea right here uh, before I share this New Testament text with you. It's just that, that your soul will be revived as you adopt spiritual practices to live your life with God. So in Matthew 11, 28 and 29, Jesus put some specifics to Psalm 23. He says this to his disciples. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, he says, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find, look what the promise is, rest for your souls. I preached on this passage a couple of years ago, but I think it's perfect right here as we launch into this series about soul care, because that's what Jesus is offering. Here we see Jesus extending the promise of soul care. And look what's involved. He says three things. Come to me, align with me, and learn from me. And like every rabbi in his day, Jesus had two things. First, he had what was called a yoke. Not a literal yoke, like a farmer, but it's the same concept. Those of us who don't live in an agrar agrarian society need some help with this. And so I want you to imagine two oxen yoked together to pull, to pull a cart or a plow through a field. 
A yoke is that wooden instrument that connects those two oxen together. It's how you would share the weight or the force of a load. And so a yoke for a rabbi was used to describe that rabbi's set of teachings, the way that he taught people to shoulder the weight of life. And so the way he taught how to handle marriage, how to handle divorce or prayer or money or sex or conflict or the government. And so what made Jesus unique wasn't that he had a yoke, all rabbis had a yoke, it was that he had an easy yoke. Secondly, Jesus had apprentices. In Hebrew, the word is tal talmudim. It's usually translated disciples, and that's fine. But an even better word to capture the idea behind talmudim is the word apprentices. So to be a disciple of Jesus is to be an apprentice under Jesus. Think about what an apprentice does. If you're an apprentice to an electrician or an engineer, you spend time with her or him. You, you learn to do the things that she does. And eventually, when she's not there, you hope to pattern your ways after what she would do if she were you. And so Jesus, the teacher, is inviting us to do life with him in a soul-nourishing way. And I want to get really practical and look at this passage and explore how to revive your soul. And so here's the first key. It's to spend time with Jesus. You see, at the beginning of verse 28, he says very simply, come to me. This is the most beautiful and generous invitation of Jesus. It's time together. You know, the most basic call of Jesus Christ to his disciples was a ministry of presence. Come and be with me. And, and yes, guys, we're going to go on mission and we're going to reach the world and we're going to heal people. And we're going to feed people. And we're going to do miracles. We're going to teach parables. I'm going to go to the cross. But all of that flowed out of the presence of Jesus with them as his apprentices. And he brings the same offer to us. Come to me, he says. Will you live your life practicing the presence of Jesus? Will you take the ordinary moments of your life and will you make them holy by involving the presence of Jesus? Like the first cup of coffee you drink in the morning, the text message that, that, that you share with your friend, the Zoom meeting at work, the, the brush of shoulders with a stranger at the gas station, the, the recounting of your day with your spouse, the evening time on the couch. These moments could be brimming with the very presence of Jesus. I, I recently read the biography of Eugene Peterson. He was the author of the, the Message, the Bible version. He described one of, in one of his journals how he would start each day on their little ranch on a lake in Montana. He says, I get up at 5.50, I go to the kitchen and prepare the morning coffee for Jan, that's his wife, and me. I turn on the radio to the NPR station to orient myself to the world's idea of what's going on. I grind African-grown coffee beans either from Kenya or Zimbabwe, and while they're brewing, I walk down to the lake shore and perform my morning mikvah, a perficatory prayer. In anticipation of following Jesus for the next 18 or so hours. And so the so-called news is fairly predictable. The death of some world leader, celebrity, war, casualties, political scandal or infighting. Conspicuously deficient in person, in beauty, in goodness, and in truth. There is no sign of transcendence. The coffee is done. In six minutes, I pour two mugs into an aluminum coffee flask and take it to Jan. I pour myself a mug and take it to a beach overlooking our mountain lake. I sip it, pray the Psalms, meditate the presence and the word of God. Pray. You know, we often focus so much on the big goals of the Christian life. I want to be more spiritual. I want to be a better dad. I want to be a Christian leader. I want to be a godly influence in my workplace. But the only way to achieve those goals is to focus on the small daily habits that will eventually lead you there. Like the things you fill your time with. They're going to shape the trajectory of your life. So this whole series, we're going to be looking at practices that will help you to spend better time with Jesus. Here's the second way to revive your soul. It's to learn from Jesus. And so first he said in verse 28, come to me. And then in 29 he says, learn from me. It's one of the main jobs of an apprentice, isn't it? It's to learn from the teacher. Now, there are the obvious things that we can learn from Jesus, like from both his teachings and his example. And so his teachings first, like he taught things like turn the other cheek and the last will be first and love your neighbor as yourself and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. There are many parables, there are many sermons, there are many prayers that he prayed, many healings that he accomplished. His teachings were brilliant. 
Have you ever reflected on the fact that Jesus is the smartest person that ever lived? Here's Dallas Willard again. He said, at the literally mundane level, Jesus knew how to transform the molecular structure of water to make it wine. That knowledge also allowed him to take a few pieces of bread and some little fish and feed thousands of people. He could create matter from the energy. He knew how to transform the tissues of the human body from sickness to health, from death to life. He knew how to suspend gravity, interrupt weather patterns, eliminate unfruitful trees without a saw or an ax. He only needed a word. Surely he must be amused at what Nobel Prize winners are awarded for today. Jesus had a cognitive and practical mastery of every phase of reality, physical, moral, spiritual. He's not just nice. He's not just moral. He is brilliant. He is the smartest man who ever lived. And he's now supervising the entire course of world history while simultaneously preparing the rest of the universe for our future role in it. He always has the best information on everything and certainly on the things that matter most in human life. And so we can learn from his genius in full confidence and we can ask him to guide our decisions. See, when our learning lines up with his teaching, we're on the right track because his teaching is the best thinking on the subject. Not only can we learn from his teaching, but we can learn from Jesus' way of life. It's the third thing I want you to see about being an apprentice of Jesus. The third key to reviving your soul is to adopt his lifestyle. Like if you go back to our passage and look at verse 29 where he says, take my yoke upon you. You know, John Mark Comer talks a lot about this in his great book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. That that Jesus' yoke is the key to true spiritual revitalization, to true soul care. And some of you are like, well, that sounds just about like religion, saddling a big wooden yoke around people's neck, burdening them with all the rules and regulations. But listen, remember, Jesus is giving this yoke as a solution to you and to others who are burdened and heavy laden. The yoke of Jesus is described as easy and light, and it is given to us as the solution to the problem of an exhausted life. But the weird thing about it is a yoke is a work instrument for plowing fields. And it seems like it would be what exhausted people need the least. Like they need a nap or a trip to Cancun or a foot massage. They don't need a yoke. But here's what Jesus knows that we don't know. Jesus knows that the most restful gift that he can give those who are tired is a new way to carry their lives a fresh way to bear their responsibilities. He realizes that life is a series of burdens. I appreciate this about our faith. It's realistic. Life is a series of burdens. And instead of offering an escape, like a Netflix binge or a spa day, Jesus offers equipment. But it's equipment that will connect us intimately to him. Jesus' invitation is to take up his yoke. And it's an invitation to travel through life at his side. Learning to shoulder the weight of life with ease because he is carrying the burden. To step out of our frantic, consumer-driven society to a life of soul rest. Because now, where I go, he goes. And where he goes, I go. He's a constant companion and friend. And so we adopt Jesus' lifestyle the rhythms and routines that make up his day-to-day existence. And it will impact you incredibly when you organize your time and when you leverage your energy around the ways that Jesus does. You see, if the results that you're currently getting with your life are lousy, like your anxiety is at a constant simmer, like mild depression is a close friend, high levels of stress, chronic emotional burnout, toxic relationships, little to no sense of the presence of God, then the odds are that there's something about the way you're approaching your life that's off kilter. The rhythms and the routines are wrong. The way you've organized your morning and the evening, your schedule, your budget, your relationship to your phone, how you manage your resources of time and money and attention, something's out of whack. And so we learn from Jesus a simple set of practices, things like building in rhythms of silence and solitude, away from the noise and notifications building in proper rest. Like more than once we read stories of Jesus sleeping and the disciples frantically waking him up. Some of you are like, this is a savior I can follow. (laughs) A napping Jesus. He shows us the practice of simplicity, the practice of Sabbath. 
And ironically, the practices are almost never commanded by Jesus. Like the one exception is prayer, which is commanded multiple times. But Jesus never commands you to wake up in the morning and have a quiet time. He never commands you to read your Bible, to live in community, to practice Sabbath, to give your money to the poor. None of these core practices. He, he just does them. Again and again, he does them. And then he says, follow me. Or as we said earlier, apprentice under me. It's an invitation. Take my yoke on you so that we can walk together through these things. Jesus is saying, copy the details of my life. Take the template of my day-to-day -day life as your own. The thing I love so much is that it's not a legalistic guilt trip. It's an invitation. It's an invitation to the life that we actually ache for. It's a life that can be found only by moving through the world shoulder to shoulder with Jesus. So guys, this whole series is going to be about exploring very practically, what does that rhythm look like? What are those practices? And each week we're going to provide the, the good portion of a service to actually do, to, to actually practice the practices. It's going to be a bit like a workshop. It's a little bit non-traditional for a church service, but it'll be helpful. I, I really think so. And we're hoping that these practices are going to give you a solid spiritual toolbox as we enter into the season of Lent this year. And maybe you'd be able to practice the presence of Jesus this year like never before in your life. And in the process, I believe that your soul will be restored and revitalized and everyone in the orbit of your life will benefit. So today as we begin, I would love for you to consider, how is your soul? Like for real, what's the status of the most important part of you? And what is your current weekly rhythm? Like what, what is your time and energy expenditure looking like these days? Right now I'm gonna turn things over to your host for a little soul care workshop. I pray this time is gonna be very meaningful to you. I love you guys. <laughs>